Okay, it's just gone three o'clock, so let's get started. Welcome to uh, the webinar today from Move Solutions. Uh, we're going to be talking about expanding the potential of rail monitoring with uh, Move Solutions structural health monitoring sensors, uh, communication uh, gateways and protocol, and the uh, integrated cloud platform and visualization of the data. So the topics we're going to be talking about today. Um, for first off, we'll start with uh, outlining the rail behaviours that um, we really want to be able to observe, uh, the different dynamics of those, um, some of them of which we can observe with static behaviour um, and evolution over time with periodic measurements, uh, those that we need to have a more dynamic view of and uh, how we can support that um, through the MOVE system and the sensors that we have available. Um, we're going to talk briefly about the external factors. So although we're looking at the rail behaviours, what are the multitude of considerations around um, external factors affecting those rail dynamics? Uh, we'll be looking at the, the static and dynamic observations and, and the challenges around that with regards to the volume of data that um, can be acquired and how we manage that, uh, that volume of data to make some meaningful analytics and uh, interpretations. We'll cover off the Move Solution sensors themselves, uh, their functionality, and then we'll talk about, uh, specific to rail, how we would install those uh, to get a, a great view of the um, different dynamics that we're able to observe. Uh, we will talk about the cloud platform and the uh, visualization of data, but also the configuration of the system, which is incredibly simple and quick to do. Um, and then we'll talk very briefly around the associated structures with rail. So uh, in addition to the tracks themselves and the ballast and sleepers, um, how does that integrate uh, and, and uh, coexist with structures, platforms, uh, bridges, viaducts, and how can the system be used to um, integrate the monitoring of both the rail itself, but also those associated assets as well? So rail behaviours, what, what is it that we want to observe if we look at um, the different uh, variable aspects of the rail itself? Well, the, uh, one of the main challenges is rail alignment. Are we actually seeing the, the tracks themselves maintaining their alignment over time? The twist and cant of the track. So are we seeing a deformation of the, the um, original installation? And is that presenting challenges to the stability of the, the rolling stock? The vertical deflection. So are we seeing uh, an increase in the uh, either incline or decline of the track, whether that's over a longer length or over a much shorter um, length of rail and therefore presenting challenges in terms of the, the smoothness and, and uh, flow of the rail. Lateral slew, are we seeing lateral movement of the sleepers and the track, uh, something which I know is of significant consideration and concern over the hotter weather periods, um, something that uh, very recently there's been a, a number of communications with Network Rail around specifically how do we observe um, the, the temperature increase in uh, implications to lateral slew of the rails. The ballast stability, whether this is just the ongoing evolution of the ballast uh, under the rails or whether there is a construction, remedial works or other activities uh, adjacent to the rail, which is having an impact on the stability of the, the ballast and therefore the rail itself. And the rail's behaviour over length. So this is not just uh, the rail itself, but also how it's behaving in relation to um, structures that it is uh, utilising, so bridges, viaducts, tunnels, um, and whether that is having a direct impact on the, the rails uh, stability and safety. So we have a number of uh, areas to consider around the, the different elements of, of rail that we've just covered. Um, some of these are the rails behaviour, the, the evolution of rail over time, the, the fact that this structure will age over time from its point of installation. But we also have a number of environmental factors to consider. We've mentioned the, the temperature already. We have physical factors to consider, uh, and I'll cover off what I mean by that in just a moment. And we have some human factors to consider as well. So if we look at the environmental factors, what are the different uh, elements that could have a direct impact on the, the safety and continuity of the, the rail line? We have uh, rainfall, so in terms of moisture, flooding, um, and considerations on the integrity of ballast and surrounding uh, groundworks. We have ground movement, so where we have embankments uh, and other raised or lowered areas of track, is are we seeing ground movement in that um, relating ground that is presenting a challenge to the rail itself? We mentioned briefly temperature, 
and where we have more severe wind, uh, sorry, weather uh, conditions, uh, are we able to monitor the, the impact of wind, not just on uh, the track itself, but obviously the environment around it as well, trees, fences, um, and structures potentially. In terms of physical factors, there are a number of physical elements that can have a direct impact on, on the position and safety of the track. Uh, one of the major challenges when it comes to rail monitoring is uh, localised earthworks. So do we have earthworks going on nearby, on top of, underneath um, the rail and the rail structures that is presenting a risk? Uh, rail strikes, whether that is um, issues with the infrastructure itself or the associated structures, which will have a direct impact on the safety of the rail. Uh, we mentioned just the general degradation of the, the structure over time, the sleepers, the tracks themselves, and use. Uh, these are uh, heavy vehicles using these structures on a, on a daily basis, and that will have uh, a wear and tear on the structure's integrity over time. And if we then look at the human factors, um, there is a, a very expensive and ongoing maintenance um, project and, and uh, requirement across the entire rail network, which in itself presents a challenge in terms of um, the, the condition in which the rail is left after that maintenance, but also the management of that maintenance over time and the prioritization of that maintenance. Uh, there are always going to be instances of the need for repair and the same challenges present themselves, whether or not the repair is um, completed to an adequate standard, but equally which repairs uh, are the most um, the highest priority to attend to. Uh, the ongoing challenge of, of vandalism, whether that's vandalism of the rails themselves or of structures um, and in the environment around the rail. And uh, the ongoing challenge of engineering calculations is, is making, um, making those engineering calculations are, are based on a multitude of um, considered variables. And, and what we know in many cases is that the environment may present a, a challenge to those calculations um, and are we able to observe the behaviour of the rail and the structures in their actual real world state to be able to compare to those engineering calculations. I forgot to mention at the beginning of the webinar, if you do want to raise uh, any questions, please feel uh, free to do so via the Q&A, uh, which if you click on the Q&A, you'll be able to raise a question with us. Just had a comment that the, the quality of the sound is, is quite poor, so I'll, um, I'll move the speaker closer to me. Hopefully that resolves that a little bit for you. Please let me know if you are struggling. So the data volume, uh, one of the, the big considerations when we're looking at sensor-based monitoring is how many data points are we collecting and how do we make meaningful um, analysis and interpretation of that data? Well, if we take the, the dynamics that we're observing statically, so we're taking fixed point in time measurements uh, and we are comparing those to see whether or not we're seeing any significance in, in movement or variance in, in that data. Uh, those uh, different variables would be rail alignment, twist and cant, vertical deflection and lateral slew. Um, and if we take, for example, a tilt measurement for that, uh, if we had our um, three sensors, <clears throat> and we're using a very small number, but just to highlight the point here, if we have three sensors providing data readings for us, and they're providing a reading ev on every 30 minute intervals, sorry, uh, I correct myself there, we have three readings per sensor. So we're looking at uh, a temperature reading and an X and a Y reading. We have a reading taken every 30 minutes and we have 10 sensors in alignment. That produces 1,140 data points every day that we then need to be able to meaningfully compare uh, and to draw some conclusions on the condition position of the rail or asset that we're monitoring. If we move on to the dynamic observations, so looking at ballast stability or lengths of rail and rail structure that we want to observe their dynamic response to the loads passing over them or to uh, as we mentioned earlier, some of the considerations, so earthworks, um, potentially vandalism, or just the evolution of the, the structure's integrity over time. If we use a, a similar example, so we have 10 sensors, um, each taking four readings. We have, uh, in this instance, now three axis, an X, Y, and Z reading, and a temperature reading. And these sensors are sampling at 100 readings per second, so at 100 hertz. That presents us with 345 million data points per day to analyze and interpret. 
So how do we make some meaningful uh, evaluation of such significant volume of data? So what I'm going to do is run through the sensor types that move supply, um, but also some of the smart functionality that they have in terms of how they monitor and then acquire data to minimize the volume of data, which is effectively white noise. So base level data, which is well within a tolerance that we know to be acceptable. If we start with the tilt meters, uh, we have a wireless tilt meter communicating over LoRaWAN, and I'll touch on the advantages that we see of using LoRaWAN as a communication, as a wireless communication protocol for our sensors. Uh, they have an integrated temperature sensor, so for every reading of their tilt position, they also provide an ambient uh, temperature reading as well. Uh, they have a very easy installation and configuration, which we'll cover a little later on in the webinar. Um, ultra low noise performance, so in terms of the, the interference and quality of data, uh, we have a very high confidence in the continuity and quality of the data they're presenting. They have an exceptionally long battery life, both uh, achieved in terms of their operation when providing data, but also in terms of the uh, some of the software and hardware, um, and one of those particular elements of hardware we'll cover later on in the webinar which is the, the radio module contained within the sensor, which means we get exceptional battery uh, life and exceptionally low um, power consumption. The sensors are uh, IP67. We've had um, several questions about these sensors being installed close to uh, water or where there is a risk of them being submerged. And that doesn't present an issue for uh, tilt meters at all. And that includes saltwater environments as well. Um, and the firmware on these sensors is updated remotely. So we use the LoRaWAN communication in reverse from our gateways to our sensors uh, to update any firmware on the sensor in situ. So it doesn't need to be removed or recalibrated. Uh, the sensor firmware is updated while on site as part of a project. If we move on to our accelerometer. So the tilt meter taking static readings um, between two minutes um, and up to a much higher setting. We can take them from 15 minutes, 30 minutes, and they can be bespoke configured um, for a longer requirement of reading frequency if required. The accelerometer is a dynamic sensor. So this is constantly taking readings uh, every second. Uh, I'll cover off specifically within the configuration, the uh, variable frequencies that we're able to set. So the number of uh, sensor samples per second that this can be set to take. Um, but as we saw in the previous slide, that produces an enormous amount of uh, potential data presented to you for analysis and interpretation. The uh, sensor has a smart recording um, functionality. So although the sensor is observing the behavior constantly every second. If we assume that we have set the sensor to take uh, 100 readings per second, so operating at 100 hertz, it is taking those readings, those observations, uh, every minute of every day. However, the sensor uh, can be configured to not communicate to the cloud platform unless a threshold is exceeded. This allows us to uh, firstly establish um, over the first one to two days of installation, the white noise of the structure that we've installed it to. Um, whether that's looking at the, the behavior of the structure when there is a passing uh, train moving over, or whether or not it is just the natural oscillation of the structure. Um, all structures will have a base level oscillation, which we don't really need to observe unless we have concerns over the structure stability um, and presents us with a significant amount of data to uh, ignore and to identify the meaningful data within the, the streams. So the smart um, functionality on the accelerometer means that we're only presented with uh, events, periods of data which exceed a threshold that we have pre-configured uh, by the cloud platform. And I'll show you in a few slides how we do that and what value that has and actually how the data is, is presented to you as well. The uh, SHM accelerometer that we launched last year and which has replaced our standard accelerometer um, can be synchronized with a series of accelerometers. What this allows us to do is to um, configure a number of functionalities to provide some pre-analysis and um, to process through a, period, a series of algorithms to provide you with instant visualization of the behavior of the structure that's being observed. 
Um, so we are able through this uh, functionality to synchronize within half a millisecond. And so we can provide instant uh, model shape analysis. We can use the sensors as a trigger so that if we know we want to identify in which direction uh, a train is passing over a particular length of a rail, we can use the, the trigger threshold and the synchronization to trigger sensors to take readings uh, at a specific point and with that high degree of synchronization. They also have an integrated temperature center. So for every uh, event that they present to the cloud platform, they also present uh, an ambient temperature reading at the same time. Um, they equally have a very simple installation uh, process and a very simple configuration. Uh, much like the tilt, they have um, ultra low noise performance, so we can be very confident in the quality of data that they're presenting. And the battery life that we achieve with our dynamic accelerometers, um, let's remind ourselves that these are taking uh, upwards of 40 readings per second, up to 640 readings per second. Um, and we can achieve several years of battery life because of the smart operation uh, and the threshold settings to ensure that we're only uh, recording and communicating data when it's of meaning and a need for analysis and interpretation. The sensor as with the tilt is IP67. And again, the firmware on these is updated remotely um, using the LoRaWAN communication in reverse from our server to our gateway and over to the sensor. Apologies, my presentation is frozen there for a second. So uh, we have launched in late last year, early uh, 2022, our new vibrometer. The um, accelerometer is observing acceleration. So uh, we present this data in millijes. So the, we're talking about uh, milli g-force readings. Um, and this is observing the, uh, the force that is exerted onto the structure and therefore is picked up and read by the accelerometer. Um, and this is very useful because we're not just seeing the velocity, so the, the speed at which the structure is moving, um, but the degree of force that was exerted onto the structure. Um, and rather than just receiving a single reading, we see an event, a period of time, a, a, a series of, of data points dependent on the frequency setting. And I'll, I'll explain in a, a few slides specifically how we configure the accelerometer and what that um, affects in terms of the length of sample that we receive. But we receive a, a sample length and event which we can analyze in a number of ways um, and observe the, the uh, millijes, the acceleration that was exerted onto that structure over that period. The vibrometer that we launched uh, earlier this year um, is to serve as compliance, uh, a compliance sensor for the, uh, in the UK, the British standard for vibration monitoring, um, but is also being uh, tested to be compliant to a number of other global standards for vibration monitoring. So although the sensor is operating in terms of its internal functionality in a very similar manner to the accelerometer, the difference between the accelerometer and the vibrometer is that the vibrometer has a number of calculations uh, that it does uh, from a sample of data collected and presents a velocity reading as opposed to an acceleration reading. It will average the event, so a, a similar event length that the accelerometer uh, will record, but rather than present the, the full extent of that uh, event, it will analyze the velocity of the uh, event that it experienced, and it will uh, provide you with a PPV, a, a maximum peak-to-peak -peak velocity figure uh, for comparison to engineering calculations and the um, standards that are provided in the British standard documentation. Um, much as with the accelerometer, this is uh, a triaxial uh, XYZ device. Um, it has an activation threshold, uh, much as the accelerometer, so we can remove uh, the volume of white noise um, and low level readings that we don't need to observe. Um, it has uh, programmable acquisition so that we can set the periods at which we want a fixed reading to be taken. It has an integrated temperature sensor. So again, we're observing ambient temperature at the point of, of trigger. Um, as with all of the sensors, the installation and configuration is, is very simple. We won't go into any details specifically about the vibrometer 
um, configuration. Uh, there is a previous web webinar that covered the vibrometer. And if you would like any more details on the vibrometer, I'd be very happy to arrange a, a meeting with you to talk specifically about that sensors functionality. Um, again, we achieve exceptionally long battery life for this um, battery powered wireless sensor, about two years, depending on the uh, configuration and frequency of recordings. And again, it's an IP67 sensor. And then we have our uh, patented product, the DEC sensor. So the DEC sensor is um, a new evolution in terms of wireless sensor monitoring for dynamic behavior. Uh, the DEC sensor uh, is on, operates on a single axis. So where our accelerometer and vibrometer are operating on three axis, our uh, tilt meter on two axis, um, our deck sensor is operating on a single axis. Uh, and there are um, a number of different variants of the uh, sensor itself, dependent on the installation orientation and whether or not we want to observe the vertical or horizontal behavior of the structure. What the deck sensor is measuring is the vibrational displacement of the structure that is attached to. Um, and specific to rail, we'll be talking about its use in monitoring dynamically the behavior of the sleepers and ballast as a train passes over. So as I mentioned, um, it is monitoring on a single axis, either the uh, XY or the Z axis, dependent on its installation orientation. Again, it has the integrated temperature sensor for ambient uh, temperature readings. Um, it has very simple installation configuration and much like uh, the other sensors, we achieve exceptional battery life. And this is an IP67 sensor. So we've talked about the, the volume of data that's acquired um, by, by static and dynamic sensors and having had the overview of our sensors. Uh, one of the, the major challenges with observing rail or lengths of rail is that an individual sensor provides us with data on a, a very specific locality of its installation. The tilt uh, which we would use to observe twist and cant and vertical deflection, we can install a series of those along the length of rail but we're still receiving data for each individual point that then needs further analysis and interpretation to understand whether or not we're seeing anomaly behaviors along that length of rail. What Move Solutions uh, are able to do via our cloud platform is to automatically link that data between those sensors and to use algorithms within the cloud platform to calculate the displacement between each of those sensors and present that rather than just as a degree of movement or tilt with each sensor, but as a millimeter per meter deflection between each of those sensors, allowing us to observe the behavior over a length of rail rather than having to interpret multiple individual sensors and the data that they're providing. If we look at the dynamic behavior, so uh, looking at acceler accelerometers and the deck sensor, again, by installing individual sensors, uh, we can uh, capture a significant amount of data. Uh, as we saw in the slide earlier, um, just 10 sensors will present us with over 350 million data points per day uh, based on 100 Hertz readings. What we really want, uh, and as I mentioned when we were talking about the sensors, is for them to uh, capture data when we see a meaningful activity. So as you'll see in the animation, as we see the uh, vibration of the structure as the load passes, we want the sensors to be triggered and to present us with the data that is of, of interest to us when we're seeing a significant impact, uh, vibration and oscillation of the structure that we want to observe. And that is exactly how these sensors are operating. So a series of sensors can be triggered in sequence or in synchronization, dependent on their configuration, uh, to capture the data at the point at which the, the structure is placed under an increased load uh, or is impacted by strikes, localized construction activities or uh, environmental um, elements that are affecting the, the structure's integrity and behavior. And outside of the, the capabilities of the move sensors, there may be a, a host of other geotechnical or environmental um, behaviors and attributes that we want to observe. And we can do that with the Move Solution system via our nodes. We have two different node types. We have a, an analog node uh, and a digital node for uh, Modbus RTU uh, communication protocol sensors. 
what we're able to do uh, with these is take wired sensors and integrate them into our wireless LoRaWAN communication. So by connecting uh, up to four sensors with the analog node or one sensor type or up to 30 in a chain to the digital node, uh, the node itself then takes that data and communicates it over our LoRaWAN network. And we can present that data on the cloud platform as we do with our own sensors uh, in a meaningful visual manner. Um, and we'll touch on the configuration of these sensors a little later on. So the sensor placement, uh, where do we put the, the sensors to be able to achieve these readings? Well, if we start with the, the tilt sensors, those can be either placed directly onto the rail, or if we want to extend the, the range of observation, by installing them on tilt meters, sorry, tilt beams, um, either these are normally in, in meter lengths, so one, two or three meter lengths. We then extend the range of observation uh, of each of those tilts. And rather than looking at the individual sleeper behavior, we're looking uh, over the, the length of the rail behavior. And as you can see, by linking these together, we can then uh, connect that data as we showed in the previous slide and provide the, the deflection, the deformation over uh, a length of rail as opposed to interpreting the individual sensors. As you can see, we then have a line of sensors along the center of the track. And by having this uh, dual placement, this allows us to look at the twist and cant of the rail. So whether we're seeing a consistent uh, movement or tilt of the track across its lateral uh, width, or whether or not we're seeing um, some deformation across the width of the track and we're starting to see some uh, twist in terms of the presentation of, of the rails. Moving to the accelerometers, if we're observing the behavior of uh, rail in association with a structure that it is passing over or through or under, uh, so when we're talking about the um, interrelationship between a length of rail and a tunnel or a length of rail and a bridge or a viaduct, uh, we can, uh, by installing the accelerometers as presented here, so along the length of the rail, we can observe the dynamic behavior of that structure as a whole. Um, so the uh, ability for the high level of synchronization between the accelerometers means that we can present to the cloud platform the highly accurate synchronized readings. Um, and through an algorithm within and a, a tool within the cloud platform, we can present an instant model shape uh, graph which can then be compared and analyzed over time. So we can uh, observe the evolution of the uh, frequency response of the structure and um, observe whether or not we're seeing a continuous symmetry of that uh, response or whether or not we're starting to see some unusual asymmetrical behavior, which would present the fact that we have significant changes in the structural integrity of uh, the relationship between the rail and the structure that it, uh, it is passing through or over. And if then we look at the deck sensors, so uh, the deck sensors placed directly onto the uh, sleepers and monitoring the vibrational deflection of the sleeper and the relating rail and ballast underneath as the train passes over. Uh, this allows us to identify whether or not we are seeing a consistent response in the vibrational displacement um, of the uh, sleepers and therefore the relating rail over a length or whether we're seeing anomalies in that um, deflection and therefore presenting concerns over the uh, density and stability of the, the void below, uh, sorry, the ballast below the, the train line. Uh, I forgot to mention when we were talking about the, the sensors that the deck sensor is recording uh, a millimeter displacement, plus and minus, so uh, up and down as the, um, as the uh, sleeper oscillates as the train passes over. Um, and this allows us to uh, observe and compare that deflection um, over a length of rail, as I said, to then identify areas of concern where we're seeing an increase in that oscillation as the train is passing over. So I mentioned that the uh, sensors are um, very simple to install. They are incredibly easy to um, deploy. As you can see, uh, and as uh, is stated there on the text, when the sensor is, uh, has a battery inserted, it is constantly looking for a connection to a gateway. 
So it is uh, always observing whether or not there is the LoRaWAN gateway connected and powered within range. And as soon as it identifies that there is a gateway powered and within range, it will start uh, communicating data um, dependent on the sensor type based on its uh, initial default configuration to that gateway. That uh, configuration can then be set via the cloud platform and that is updated instantly to the sensor and affects the, the frequency and programming of how that sensor is capturing data and presenting it. And I mentioned that we, um, we utilize the LoRaWAN communication um, protocol for our sensors. And the main reason being uh, is that we're able to achieve significant battery length because of the low power consumption, but also significant communication range. Uh, we can achieve in excess of one kilometer communication range between a sensor and the gateway, which means that if, uh, if needs uh, be that the gateway doesn't have to be installed in close proximity to the rail or to the rail uh, structure, that it can be positioned at a point which is convenient and providing as near line of sight. Uh, although having line of sight between the sensor and the gateway will increase the communication range, um, it is still possible to have a good connection over a significant distance without absolute line of sight between the, uh, the sensor and the gateway. So one of the uh, key reasons that we're able to achieve the, um, the superb computational power, the micro uh, low power consumption, and uh, the range of LoRaWAN communication is that each of our sensors has inside it the MoveX uh, memory chip, which was developed in-house by Move specifically to uh, improve the communication range and low power consumption of the sensors. So this is a, an in-house developed chip that is present in all of our sensors. Um, and our subdivision of MoveX actually provides this uh, for development within other um, uh, circuit boards and uh, IoT devices as well. Um, and this has been uh, a significant development in the advantage of the communication range, and as I said, the, the power, low power consumption of our sensors. So as I mentioned, all of our sensors are um, configured and uh, prevent data via the cloud platform. What I'm going to share with you now is a short screen recording of how to configure uh, a setup and just how quickly that can be done. So this is our cloud platform. And you can see there are an, a small array of sensors there on a length of rail. By going into the menus and settings, you can see I've got the different uh, options for settings down the left hand side. If I just pause that video there, it's going to let me. You can see that each of our sensors has a, a name that is given to it. Uh, and this is the sensor ID for us to be able to identify each of those sensors. Um, this can be overwritten with a bespoke location name uh, or a code which is relevant to your project. I mentioned we can change the, the frequency of the recordings for a tilt. So you can see very quickly, just by clicking on uh, the different time frames, I can move the frequency from two minutes to 30 minutes. The alarm level, again, very quickly, we can turn on and off the alarms. Uh, and if I just skip back very quickly by, apologies, screen is fighting with me. Uh, by clicking on the uh, pen marker to the right, we can adjust what those alarm levels are set at. And as you saw through the animation there, by turning on and off these uh, tick buttons, we can identify whether or not we want to receive the alarms on both the phi and the theta axis, uh, or whether we want to receive it on only one or on neither. One of the uh, key challenges when in, uh, installing tilts is that they will never be installed on absolute zero. Um, and so we have a very simple uh, the reset of the offset on the sensors once installed. So once the uh, system, the sensors are completely installed, uh, we can enter the cloud platform. And as you'll see uh, in the video here, by simply clicking reset all and okay, that has now zeroed all of the sensors within uh, our project. 
and ensured that we are um, observing from a zero position irrelevant of the sensor's actual orientation when installed. So you may have noticed when we were on the alarm page that our alarm setting was in millimeters per meter. If we go to the unit settings, we can very quickly change between degrees and millimeters per meter. This will change the uh, unit of measure that the data is presented in, and it will also change the unit of measure that we can set the alarm for. You'll notice the last um, menu option we have on the top there is positioning. We won't cover that uh, today. That is um, relevant specifically to looking at static load deflection of bridge structures. So if we then go back into our menu and this time we select the accelerometer. Uh, apologies, it's now just jumped forward for me. Not very helpful at all. You can see again that we can uh, change the, the name of the sensor from its um, original determined coding. We can't change this original coding, that it's uh, what the sensor is identified uh, by throughout the uh, MOVE communication protocol, but we can add our own reference uh, name to it dependent on the project and our own uh, system setup for the uh, project monitoring project we have. Very similar to the uh, tilt meters, we can uh, set a cadence for the um, frequency of repeating measures. So between one hour and 24 hours. This will take a uh, repeating sample length, um, every frequency that is set, so between an hour and 24 hours. Um, and this is in addition to the threshold trigger, which allows us to take uh, a sample point at the same time every hour or every two hours up to every 24 hours to be able to have a, an event for comparison. If we are using the activation threshold level, we would advise that you set this to 24 hours. The sample that it uh, takes on this frequency recording is a little longer than the uh, threshold triggered sampling. Um, and because of the volume of data and the uh, packaging and communicating of that data, we do leave the sensor blind for about 20 minutes while it communicates that through to the gateway. So if we're not using this frequency of reporting as, as part of our um, observations, by setting it to 24 hours, it will take one of these sample readings every day for comparison, um, and we'll leave the sensor operating on the threshold operation for the rest of the period. But you can see I can adjust that very quickly by just switching between them. I mentioned earlier that um, the uh, accelerometer is monitoring in millijis. And here we have our alarm level. So this isn't the threshold for activation. This is the higher alarm level where you'll be notified that this level has been exceeded. Um, and again, we have our pen marker. So to adjust this, we would just click on our pen marker and change our alarm level here. Apologies again, it's decided to jump out of the video. Okay, so our um, resolution allows us to reduce the, uh, the, the level of resolution that sensor has uh, and therefore increase the uh, number of sense, uh, sorry, number of readings that the sensor is taking. So set on its uh, default setting at 0 0.031, so it's higher, highest resolution, um, the sensor will take a sample length of 1,024 samples every time it is triggered. If we reduce the uh, resolution, we can increase the number of samples that are taken up to 4,096 samples. We then move on to the threshold activation. We saw in the alarm uh, level that we were able to set a millijis um, of acceleration uh, or force that we can uh, be informed through an email. The activation threshold is the level at which the sensor is activated. We'll record if at the highest resolution are 1,024 uh, data points and communicate that to the cloud platform. And as you can see, if we click on the pen marker, it will allow us to amend that very simply. And here we have our three different uh, trigger 
methods for the sensor. In the, the standard trigger functionality, by setting our activation threshold, the sensor is then triggered every time that uh, threshold is exceeded. We can set it to synchronize. In the synchronization mode, uh, we will take uh, highly, accurate, highly accurately synchronized readings across uh, a number of sensors and be able to provide instant model shape analysis uh, of the structure being observed. Or we can have a combination of both where we are taking uh, both the synchronized readings, but also maintaining the uh, trigger standard functionality when the threshold is exceeded. And then our sampling frequency is the number of uh, readings per second. And you can see that that range between 40 and 640, as I mentioned earlier. So if we then move on to the deck sensor, you can see a very similar um, set of options to those for the accelerometer. Although this time we're now looking at millimeters per meter, sorry, millimeters of um, oscillation as opposed to uh, the acceleration in millijes. I'll just pause that very quickly there. Um, and you can see we've got our alarm level that operates uh, very similarly to the accelerometer. Our resolution, which is standard, um, the sensor is set to observe uh, up to three millimeters plus and minus. We can reduce that uh, and therefore increase the range of observation to six millimeters. But it's key to remember that this isn't monitoring absolute displacement. It is monitoring the vibration or the oscillation displacement of the structure. And then our activation threshold, much like the accelerometer, but we're updating that now in millimeters as opposed to millijes of force. And then finally, we move to the analog node, which could have a multitude of sensors attached to it. You can see in this example, we have some environmental sensors. We can turn on and off each of the channels within the sensor just by the, selecting the tick boxes here. And you can see that they each highlight at the top menu there. We go into the noise sensor, we can name the sensor, we can define the communication protocol, the number of wires that it's connected by, our full scale, our unit of measure, and we can also set uh, alarm levels on these uh, sensors that are integrated via the analog node as well. So you can see a very simple uh, configuration process can all be done either on site uh, with an iPad or the phone, uh, or can be done um, post installation remotely. The system can be pre configured. Um, the only recommendation, if you were to do so, is to uh, set the offset correction for the tilt meters after installation to ensure that they're reading from, from zero. So, as I mentioned earlier, we also have a number of algorithms within the cloud platform, and we have a specific tool that is relevant to Rail. So you can see here in the menu, we have uh, within tools, a rail tool. You can see here that we have a length of rail with the sensors placed on the central sleepers and then on the tilt beams across the bottom. And we can define the distance between each of these sleepers um, within the settings. You can see we can define and set up the number of sleepers that we're observing, the sleeper height. We can define the uh, tilt beams and which of the sleepers that they're attached to. If I just pause that there very quickly, uh, by changing, apologies, very jerky mouse today, which isn't helping me in the slightest. I'll just pause that there. Uh, so you can position each of these sensors. If this was a new setup, we would be presented with the tilts available to us here and the tilt beams. And we simply click edit and drag and drop these into location uh, so that they're in situ in the right uh, order along the length of rail. So why would we do this? But by doing this, the cloud platform is then enabled to run uh, an algorithm and a rail tool, which would present us with a visualization of the deformation of the rail over that length. And you can see here, we have our length of uh, rail with our sleepers on tilt beams. And here we have the uh, millimeter per meter movement between each of those sensor positions over that length. And we can adjust the scale. It will auto scale uh, to maximize the graph visibility. Um, but we can then adjust that scale uh, if we're looking at something which is particularly exceptionally small. Um, these, uh, the tilt meters will take a reading of 0 0.001 degrees. 
Um, so it is important to observe the uh, axis dimensions to make sure that we're aware of not the uh, significance of the movement on the graph, but the relative um, axis that uh, axis scale that we are reviewing. And you can see down the right hand side here that each time the tilts are triggered by the frequency that we set, it is creating a new broken line graph uh, to present to us. Uh, so we've had a question which is relevant to this point, so I will answer that now. The question is, um, does the rail function have the ability to fix the zero at both ends? Uh, the rail uh, tool has a fixed zero at, as you can see on this graph here, fixed zero at the starting position. Uh, however, if you are looking for the zero to be fixed at both ends, um, the uh, bridge tool that we have, the static deflection uh, bridge tool, uh, does fix at both ends. Um, obviously, if we're reserving a bridge, you would have a fixed pier at either end of the structure, and we're looking at the deflection in between the two. Um, the tool was developed to observe the deflection between two fixed zero points for a pier, but equally, if we wanted zero points at either end of our rail length, that tool would present us with uh, the same broken line representation between a fixed zero point at either end. So if we then look at how the data is presented for a uh, dynamic sensor, if we start with an accelerometer, so each time the accelerometer is triggered, uh, we receive a, an event recording. And this is uh, the full screen capture for uh, a single event. You can see down the right hand side here, we have the registration of each of those events. Each one is dated, time stamped. Uh, is presented with a peak to peak reading. So the, the mass, uh, maximum millijis of force in both positive and negative that the uh, sensor experienced. And it will uh, calculate uh, which of those was the greatest across the three axis and present that to you as a PPK maximum uh, for each of the events each time the, the sensor exceeded the threshold. The top half of the uh, cloud platform, we see the event recording. So this is the plus and minus uh, millijis of force uh, across each of the axes. So we have the X, the Y, and the Z. And this is our time frame. So dependent on uh, the Hertz that we're recording at, um, the length of time will vary uh, from a 40 Hertz reading will be a much longer sample length if we've configured it to a 640 Hertz sample length, it'll be a much shorter, shorter time length. Um, and on the uh, standard resolution, that will be recording 1,024 uh, samples, data points. So you can very quickly do the maths at 640 um, Hertz, we're recording just under two seconds of activity. If we're recording at 40 Hertz, that is a significantly greater length of uh, event that we're recording. The Lower half of the um, cloud platform here, we have the frequency response. So the, the rate of oscillation that the structure experienced, and you can see in this particular example, a very consistent um, oscillation of the event. Uh, this, this particular event was a piling activity. We can uh, quite quickly identify those. We have these broken points in between the pile activity, and that quite consistently would have a, a very standard and repeating frequency response. Um, if we have a greater variety of frequency elements to the uh, event, we would see those presented across the graph from our zero frequency up to our higher rate of, of oscillation at the right hand side. And here at the bottom, we have our temperature readings over the period of time that we're observing. Um, you can alter the period of which you want to uh, look at the, the events triggered and the temperature graph will adjust to that given period. So from observing over a day or two to over a, a six month period or longer, the uh, temperature readings will present across the time frame. If we then look at the uh, deck sensor, the deck sensor will prevent, present sorry, a very similar set of graphs although rather than presenting in millijis, it will be presenting in millimeters, positive and negative, but the overall presentation is very similar. Um, you will also receive the frequency response, so the rate of oscillation. 
Um, but within the uh, tools, we're then able to look at the evolution, so the displacement trend over time. Um, and you can see we have a, a number of sensors presented here, and we're tracking their displacement over uh, what is about a month's period here. Again, we can change uh, the time scale that we're looking at to uh, observe that over a much longer length. Uh, we have had a question just relating to um, the number of sensors over a length of rail. I will come to that at the end of the session, if that's okay. So if we then look at uh, multiple applications for monitoring, so rather than just the rail, we mentioned that we would talk about other structures and some of the tools that we have available in the cloud platform to support this. Um, with the question relating to uh, being able to zero the start and end point of a rail observation, I mentioned the, the static deflection tool. Uh, that is this tool that we have here for specifically designed for bridges and viaducts, but there's no reason why it couldn't be applied to a length of rail. Um, it will always take a fixed zero position at either end of the span of observation. Um, but what it will do is calculate the uh, angular change at each of the sensor points and convert that into a millimeters per meter. And to create this model, you simply insert the distance between the pier and the first sensor, the first sensor, sorry, the pier and the second sensor, the pier and the third sensor, and we carry on until we reach the other side of the span. Um, and the algorithm will calculate that deflection over that length. Uh, if we were to utilize this for a rail length, it would do the same calculation, but we may have a, a positive and negative deformation over the length. If we look at tunnels, uh, we're able to observe the vertical position over the length of um, a rail by installing either directly onto the wall or onto uh, tilt beams. And we also have a convergence tool by, so by installing a, a series of tilts over the, the arch of the tunnel, uh, we're able to calculate the convergence um, of that structure uh, over time. We mentioned earlier in observing some of the environmental factors um, surrounding the rail, one of those being uh, embankments. And we're able uh, through the installation of tilt meters on stakes, observe um, the behavior of whether that is uh, an embankment above or embankments below the rail. Uh, and again, we can link a series of these sensors using uh, the tools available to present a broken line representation of how a length of uh, an embankment is behaving. Um, and the relative position of each tilt to another. And then looking at the, uh, the stations and platforms, um, we are able to observe a multitude of behaviors of any building structure, and this can equally be applied to uh, stations and platforms, whether that's looking at the verticality of the uh, platform wall and therefore its position in, in relationship to the rail, or whether we're looking at the actual structure itself um, and any impact uh, on its structural integrity due to passing uh, rail or structural works um, or groundworks, or whether we're just looking at the evolution of the structure's integrity in itself. So just before I recap, let's skip back that slide, I will just answer the question uh, on the number of uh, sensors that would be required for a kilometer. Um, so the recommended install um, for tilt meters is uh, on tilt beams would be every three meters um, and onto the sleepers themselves every three meters. So dependent on what behaviors you're looking to observe, uh, you would have two tilts every three meters to be able to observe the, uh, the cant and twist of the track. Um, with the deck sensors, we recommend every nine meters to be able to observe the, uh, the dynamic behavior over a length of rail. Um, and dependent on the structure type and the length, um, the accelerometers uh, would need to be calculated the, because of the, the, the different variety of observations we can take with an accelerometer. Um, it really does depend what the nature of the structure um, that the rail is linked to that we're looking to observe. Um, but in theory, we are looking at um, one to two sensors per section of observation. So if we were to look at um, the behavior of a bridge, we would have uh, one to two sensors um, between each pier span to be able to observe the behavior of, of each of those spans. So reasons why the uh, MOVE systems adds value. Well, first we mentioned the, the rapid deployment. The sensors are supplied with an installation bracket and purely need securing into place. 
the gateway switching on and they will auto connect. There's no need for on-site configuration. As mentioned, the, the auto connection. So as soon as they see a gateway uh, in range, they will connect and start communicating data to the platform. The exceptionally long life that we achieve um, in terms of the battery life of the sensors themselves. The instant data visualization, the latency on the data presentation is exceptionally low. Uh, so for a tilt, um, I have tried to demonstrate this uh, through a screen recording in terms of the latency between a sensor being triggered and the presentation of the data on the cloud platform. Um, I was unable to do so because by the time I'd refreshed the um, window viewer, it had already communicated the new data. So it is uh, within fractions of a second from the tilt recording to the data being visible on the cloud platform. Uh, if we remember that on the dynamic sensors, they're recording an event um, dependent on the configuration for the accelerometer, that could be a couple of seconds. It could be up to um, three minutes of data being recorded. Uh, and therefore, there is a slightly longer latency. Um, but still, with a sensor set at 80 hertz and recording uh, just over 10 seconds of, of data, um, the latency was about uh, eight seconds between the recording and the presentation of that visually on the cloud platform. And equally with the deck, the deck will take a 30 second sample. Um, and therefore, from the, uh, and it, sorry, it also cycles 10% um, uh, 10 seconds of constant recording. So when triggered, it stores that 10 seconds and records an ongoing 20 seconds, providing a 30 second sample in total. And that will be present within the cloud platform within about 40 seconds from that um, observation being, being made, that event being triggered. The multiple algorithms, as you may have noticed when we were on the cloud platform uh, screen recording, there was a number of other tools and algorithms available, um, less specific to rail, uh, but there are a constant development for new tools um, and visualizations of data from uh, within the cloud platform. As we've highlighted multiple applications, talking specifically about rail here, um, but we are on an almost weekly basis uh, being challenged with new structures that need to be observed. And uh, we're very blessed to have a, a structural engineer within our team who can, uh, for larger projects, put together a system proposal um, and uh, advise on where sensors should be placed to maximize the, the observation of that structure. The threshold activation of the sensors uh, for the dynamic sensors, minimizing the volume of data that we're trying to analyze and allowing us to focus on data that's of value. The uh, third party sensor integration, which allows us to integrate a host of geotechnical and environmental sensors um, and provide the data visualized within the cloud platform. The batteries within the sensors, when they do eventually expire, they can be replaced in situ. So there is no need to remove the sensors uh, to replace the batteries. They can be uh, opened on site, batteries are placed, they will auto reconnect and start transmitting data again through the uh, gateway to the cloud platform. The analysis tools. So in addition to the algorithms uh, that we have, we have, a, a, as you've seen, a number of representations um, of visual data for analysis. The long range communication, as I mentioned, we can achieve in excess of a kilometer of distance between the sensors and the gateway. Uh, we have an incredibly proactive system support. So if it is your first adoption of the system, uh, Move and our distribution partners will work with you to make sure that the installation goes uh, seamlessly. And if there are any issues uh, with the first use that we can support that, um, whether that is advising in terms of the on-site installation or with supporting with the connectivity and data representation and configuration. And lastly, our continual R&D. Um, we have some very exciting uh, releases to make in the next month or so around uh, e expansion of our ability to monitor rail. Unfortunately, I'm not in a position to share with that with you today, um, but we are continually developing uh, new sensor capability in direct response to the inquiries and challenges that we're presented with uh, by end users and by our distribution partners. So thank you very much for joining me today. I'm just going to have a quick look and see if we had any questions which we haven't already covered off. Okay, yeah, we have a question about the, um, the fastest sampling rate uh, for the observation of sleepers. Um, the deck 
uh, operates at 100 hertz. So it is taking 100 samples per second um, and taking at each one of those readings the uh, deflection position, so the displacement positive or negative, up to three millimeters. But uh, important to highlight again that that is the oscillation, the vibration displacement, not the absolute. Uh, and we have yet to have uh, an installation where the vibrational displacement exceeded that three millimeters plus or minus. Uh, and yes, the data samples are sent um, direct to the cloud platform. So if uh, we were to set the um, trigger threshold, uh, as we had on the example um, screen recording at 0.5 millimeters, uh, every time the sensor experiences a uh, displacement above that, it will record the 10 seconds of looping data. It will record another 20 seconds of data going forward, and it will present that as an event to the cloud platform. Uh, and visually, will, that will look very similar to the um, accelerometer screenshot that we saw. Um, but equally, it can uh, then be presented over time. So you can look at the, the maximum uh, oscillation over an extended length of time. So if there are any other questions you'd like to add, if you could pop them into the Q&A, um, I shall uh, keep the webinar open for another minute or so to see if there are any further questions. Equally, if there are any questions that come to mind following the event, please feel free to email either through the MOVE team or uh, contact uh, one of us via LinkedIn. You're welcome to connect and, and to ask me questions via then. Very happy to present uh, a more in-depth um, overview of the sensors, the installation um, and the communication of the sensors. And we are planning to organize a specific Q&A session for rail monitoring uh, for both asset owners and service providers so that we can um, ask for pre-registered questions and we can then respond and answer those during the session. Super, if we don't have any more questions, thank you very much for joining me today. Uh, I hope the webinar has been of value. As I said, the recording of this will be shared. Um, and uh, I really look forward to working with some of you and improving, expanding the uh, rail monitoring that you're able to provide.